American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today, we're talking about the Knights of Columbus and their remarkable work during World War I. This is really a coming of age story for the Knights. It was during this era that they really asserted themselves as the most significant lay Catholic organization in the U.S., if not the world. Right. And not only did they do amazing things that Catholics took note of, but some of the things they did here were later imitated by the government in big ways that everyone knows about, but most probably don't know that the Knights were doing these things first. This is surprisingly the first time we've talked directly about the Knights of Columbus in this podcast. It only took us until episode 70. (laughs) And as you'll hear in this episode, there are many, many other stories that we'll be able to talk about in the future. Absolutely. It took some time to decide how to limit this episode just to this narrow topic and what to leave for future episodes. Well, I'm excited we're talking about the Knights because my dad has been a Knight for a long time. I could say I kind of grew up going to Knights functions. But let's get into this story. The Knights of Columbus were, of course, founded in New Haven, Connecticut in 1882 by Father Michael McGivney, who was just beatified. Yes, he brought together men of his parish to form a society that would support fatherless families, combat anti-Catholicism, and would provide Catholic men a social organization that would prevent them feeling the need to enter other fraternal organizations that the church forbade membership in, like the Freemasons. It didn't take long for this organization to spread across the country. The Knights were also quick to establish from the get-go that they were not just a Catholic organization for Catholics, but that they were a service organization and a patriotic organization. And this all came into play in 1916. A Mexican revolutionary called Pancho Villa was causing some problems along the border with the U.S. state of New Mexico. The U.S. Army had to send troops to push back, and they eventually invaded northern Mexico to try to capture Villa. Now, there's not a whole lot going on down along the border, So there wasn't a whole lot to support the troops who were sent to the area. But the towns that were there had Knights of Columbus Council. And the Knights began to set up canteens or huts for the troops. Places where the troops could find recreation, relaxation, stationery to write home, and the Catholics could find the sacraments. All of the services were free and available to all, regardless of creed. There were 15 of these huts in all, and these huts were so successful and so well received that when the U.S. entered World War I in 1917, the Knights had every intention of continuing their service and expanding it. The Supreme Knight at the time was James Flaherty, a Philadelphia lawyer and son of Irish immigrants. He was a truly transformational figure in the Knights, and will most likely have an episode just on him at some point. With the support of the Supreme Council, Flaherty wrote to President Woodrow Wilson of the Knights' desire to help. He wrote, in part, The crisis confronting the nation hereby reaffirms the patriotic devotion of 400,000 members of this order in this country to the Republic and its laws and pledges their unconditional support to the President and Congress. This pledge of support included establishing these Knights of Columbus huts near all training bases and even to bring them overseas and establish them behind the lines where soldiers would have access to them while in theater. Flaherty made clear to the president that the services would be provided to all in uniform, regardless of creed, and none would ever be charged for anything. This arrangement was made clear in the motto of these huts, everyone welcome, everything free. And they meant that. To fund this massive undertaking, the Knights launched a fundraising campaign seeking to raise $1 million, which is a bit more than $20.3 million today, so not chump change. But the response was overwhelming. They ended up raising $14 million. So if you do the math, that means they raised $284.7 million in today's dollars. In addition to this, they were granted another $30 million to support the effort. So the total in today's money was nearly $895 million. Just a staggering figure. Truly incredible. With this money, huts were established all across the country 
near or on most every base, and then shortly after troops started shipping overseas in June of 1917, the Knights went too. Huts were built on both the eastern and the western fronts. At their peak in 1918, there were about 150 huts worldwide wherever U.S. troops were stationed, including in occupied Germany. And what the Knights provided in these huts was all about giving the troops a place to relax and find respite. Everyone could take advantage of this home-away-from-home atmosphere. But for the Catholics, including the roughly 100,000 Knights of Columbus, there was also a chaplain who could hear confessions and offer Mass. The huts were staffed with secretaries, who frequently were men who didn't qualify for military service due to some disability, but who wanted to do what they could to help. But not all were men rejected for military service. Right, there were women in the ranks. One of the more well-known people to go over to Europe as a secretary was Johnny Evers, who played second base for the World Series winning Boston Braves in 1914, was NL MVP that year, and previously had been part of the famous Tinkers to Evers to Chance double play trio with the Chicago Clubs. He was a knight, and he too wanted to do his part. The secretaries would dress in a uniform that looked similar to the soldier's own uniform, but the secretaries had badges with KC for Knights of Columbus on their shoulders. This gave rise to the secretaries being called Caseys. The Caseys handed out loads of little items like candy, gum, cigarettes, playing cards, sewing kits, razors, sporting equipment like baseballs and gloves, as well as rosaries and prayer books made especially for soldiers. They also could be found going out to the front lines among the trenches to hand out items to the boys who couldn't get back to the hut. To put into perspective the sheer amount of stuff the Knights provided, let's look at just one of the things they handed out. Stationery. Over the course of the war, the K of C huts gave away 1,800 tons of stationery so soldiers could write home. And that's a lot because it takes about 100 sheets of paper to make just one pound, and we're talking 3,600,000 pounds of paper. So if you move the decimal point two spots to the right, that means the Knights gave away about 360 million sheets of paper for letters home. That's a lot of letters coming home from over there. I see what you did there. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there. <laughs> over there. Exactly. <laughs> but mentioning the war song over there reminds me that the KFC Huts actually had their own theme song based on their motto. The words were... Everybody welcome, everything free. That is the slogan of the KFC. For all the boys here and over there, the KFC is doing its share. But the Caseys and their huts weren't just about giving away free items. They were also about events and entertainment. Right. At the huts, the troops could catch a movie, sit ringside at boxing matches, catch a vaudeville performance, find a book in the library, take part in athletic tournaments like baseball, and hear a band or other performer. So this sounds a lot like what the USO is known for. Right, pretty much. I mean, Bob Hope, etc. The military caught on that this sort of thing really is a good idea, so they made it more institutional. So as the song says, the Knights certainly did do their share through the huts. The huts, however, weren't the only way that the Knights served in the Great War. We already said that 100,000 of the 2.8 million soldiers who went to Europe were Knights of Columbus. For an order that was only 36 years old, that's a remarkable number. About 3.5% of all troops were knights, and among those 100,000 were some notables. The first to mention was the very first U.S. service member to die in the war, Lieutenant William Fitzsimmons. Fitzsimmons was a doctor from Kansas City. He was among the first five doctors to ship overseas, and he was killed on September 4, 1917, when the hospital in Pas de Calais where he was working was hit by a German bomb. Of his death, former President Teddy Roosevelt said, to the mother he leaves, the personal grief must in some degree be relieved by the pride in the fine and gallant life which has been crowned by the great sacrifice. We, his fellow countrymen, share this pride and sympathize with this sorrow. Another notable casualty was the poet Joyce Kilmer, a convert to the faith, member of the Knights of Columbus, and a fearless intelligence officer who was felled by a sniper's bullet on July 30th, 1918. We talked about him and read some of his beautiful poetry in episode 46 of this podcast. And then the final knight to die was the final U.S. officer killed in the war. First Lieutenant Father William Davitt. 
David was a priest from Worcester, Massachusetts, Noel's hometown. I know, I never knew this before. Yeah, who had volunteered to serve as a chaplain with the infantry. He had earned the Croix de Guerre and the Distinguished Service Cross for leading the effort to rescue 40 wounded men who had been cut off. On November 11th, 1918, the day the armistice was to take effect, Father David was at his regimental headquarters near the Argonne Forest. About 9.45 a.m., he climbed a tree and hung a U.S. flag in his branches. He clambered down, saluted, and began to celebrate the end of the war. One final German artillery shell came whistling over the line and struck just feet from where he stood. Father David was killed instantly, less than 75 minutes before the war was officially over. Of the 116,516 American casualties of World War I, 1,500 were knights. From the way they served in the trenches, plus the respite so many soldiers found in the huts, Knights of Columbus gained much respect and admiration for their work during the war, and their numbers swelled by 400,000 new members between 1917 and 1923. One admirer was General John Pershing, Supreme Commander of the American Expeditionary Force. He said of the Knights of Columbus, Of all the organizations that took part in the winning of the war, with the exception of the military itself, there was none so efficiently and ably administered as the Knights of Columbus. Then, when the war was over and all those boys came home, the Knights used the money, much of it was from that massive fundraising effort before the war, to establish an education fund to help soldiers pay for an education. Again, the government kind of took a cue from their work establishing the GI Bill in 1944. In the aftermath of the war, the Knights also raised money to donate a statue of the Marquis de Lafayette to the heavily Catholic town of Metz in Alsace-Lorraine. Alsace-Lorraine had been occupied by the anti-Catholic Germans for 40 years, so they very much appreciated the coming of the Americans. More than 200 knights made the trip to France for the dedication, and at the ceremony, Supreme Knight Flaherty echoed what General Pershing had said when the American forces had first arrived in 1917. Flaherty said, Lafayette, we are still here. This statue, unfortunately, only stood for 20 years. It was destroyed when the Germans reoccupied Alsace-Lorraine at the outset of the Second World War. There is much more that can be said about this trip, and we will likely have an episode in the future about the Knights and the Pope, so we'll leave more of that narrative there for now. In 2017, to commemorate the centennial of America's entry into the First World War, the Knights of Columbus opened an exhibit at their museum in New Haven, Connecticut. The display included uniforms, examples of items given away at the hut, stories, and other artifacts to tell the tale of how the Knights of Columbus made a difference during the war to end all wars. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help us out by giving us a five-star rating and a good review. And please support the many productions of SQPN at sqpn.com slash give. To learn more about the Knights of Columbus and the First World War, to find previous episodes, or to learn about our upcoming pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country, please visit sqpn.com slash history. We also love feedback and hearing about cool Catholic history sites and stories from all over. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest.